Amen. All right. So as the story continues, we see here where David is on the run. Saul is still after him. And we see in 1 Samuel chapter 23, if you look at verse 1, it said, Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they robbed the threshing floor. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. Uh, a couple things happening in this verse here. We see somebody else under attack. David is concerned for somebody else, and he prays to the Lord for wisdom for direction. His prayer is very specific. There's a couple points in this chapter we're going to learn tonight as we learn some of the characteristics of what a godly heart should look like. As you know, in Acts 13 it says, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. In the New Testament, the account was that God said, David is a man after my heart. His heart is of a godly heart, the kind of heart that it ought to be, and he will fulfill my will. David's will was to do the will of the Lord, to find, find out what that was and to make it happen. And you say, well, what does the will of the Lord look like? If you would, go to Proverbs chapter 24. Turn there real quick. I'm going to look at two verses. Proverbs chapter 24. What does the heart of God look like in a man? What ought we to look like? Uh, we're going to, we see here that David wanted to help those that could not help themselves. David defended the defenseless. My first point is that a helping heart. A helping heart. If you want to be like God, then you ought to have a heart to help others serve them where they're at and try to lift them up and encourage them. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. I want you to understand, typically the word religion in the Bible is a negative thing. That's one of the positive mentions of religion. And he says, religion is how you live what you believe which is what the book of James is all about. Now, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved by faith, what should you do? Well, let your light shine before men and let them see your good works, right? So when he says there at the end of chapter 1 in James, he says pure religion. He warns us about other religions in the, in the Bible, the false religions. But pure religion before God is this, to visit the fatherless, and the widows. These are people that can't help themselves. So a godly heart is to help those that can't help themselves. That doesn't mean you have to give money to every heroin addict on the side of the road so they can stay on heroin. No. Uh, but we ought to help the fatherless and the widows. And then he says, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Try to keep yourself pure. That's what your, your religion ought to look like. You're in Proverbs 24. If you would, look at verse number 1. I'm sorry, verse number 11. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death. Let's define this real quick. Forbear means to withhold yourself and not do something. If you don't deliver them that are drawn unto death. If you see an innocent person and they're about to die, they're in the hand of an evil person, and you don't go and deliver them and protect them and defend them, he says, if thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, behold, we knew it not, doth not he that ponder the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? Now listen, self-defense is a clear biblical concept. If somebody breaks into your house, it says, that, and you slay them, there's no blood on you, right? Uh, Jesus said, uh, get a sword. They said, here too, right? Uh, we ought to defend ourselves. We ought to defend others also. This is really what's being taught here, especially defending the defenseless. There are religions like certain sects of the Mennonites or Amish where they'll say they're pacifist or really they'll say they're non-resistant. And they'll, they say they won't resist evil if it happens. You know, it's, it's, whatever they do, I'll just see it as God's will working out. And it's like, well, God's will is you would defend your children. God's will is you would defend the innocent. God's will was that you would stand and defend your own life as it talks about in the book of Esther. 
to stand and defend and slay those that would come and slay you. So self-defense is a biblical concept, but defending the defenseless is a godly characteristic. And he points that out. He says, if you don't deliver those that are about to die, doesn't God know your heart? You, oh, I didn't know they were going to die. Well, you knew it. You could have helped. And doesn't he keep your soul? Notice that's what he says in verse 12. And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? You can go back to 1 Samuel 23. I think sometimes when we see an opportunity to help somebody and we don't help them, then God says, I, will, I wanted you to do that on my behalf and you disobeyed me, so now I'm not going to help you. When we refuse to do the service of the Lord and help those that can't help themselves, sometimes when we really need help, God doesn't come and help us. This is how this chapter starts out in 1 Samuel 23, that David sees somebody that needs help, an evil enemy is attacking, he's concerned about them because he has a helping heart, and he wants to defend them and protect them, and he asks God for help to go and do it, and he asks God for guidance to make this decision, and God gives it to him, and by the end of the chapter, when everybody's against him, God is defending him. And I think there's a correlation here. It's because he stood in defense of those that needed help. So when he needed help from God, God said, yeah, I'm going to help you because you're doing my work. You're protecting my people. Yeah. It's all connected. If you notice in verse 2, he says, therefore David inquired of the Lord. What does it mean to inquire of the Lord? Ask. Ask. Amen. What's a, what's a synonym for ask in the Bible? Pray. Pray. Petition. Asking for those supplications, right? <laughs> Lord, I need your help. I'm crying out to the Lord. I want to, here's my next point. David had a believing heart. Not only did he believe he could ask, but he believed he could get an answer. David believed so much, he had such strong confidence in God to get an answer that he was not afraid to ask very specific details, right? You think about the phrase, putting out the fleece. Who was that that did that? Gideon. Now, Gideon had such great confidence. He said, okay, Lord, do this miracle that could only be of you. Okay, Lord, oh, don't get mad at me. Let me ask one more time. Do it the opposite way. See, that's of the Lord. He asked for the impossible because he knows that we serve a God that does miracles. David here is going to ask a very specific prayer. You know what we have a tendency to do? Lord, bless my family. Amen. That's a good prayer. But do you have enough confidence to say, Lord, keep me on the right path and not give in to temptation. Lord, keep my wife, my wife cheered up. Lord, keep uh, my, my firstborn leading in righteousness and help me to build them up and see where they need help. And Lord, keep my secondborn. And do you have enough faith to pray specific prayers for those in your life that need specific help? Do you have enough faith to pray that for yourself? Oh, Lord, I'm going through something, and I'm going, I, I, I got, I'm going through a slump, and I know you can get me out of it. And I know if I just ask you for help that you will do it. And I'm not afraid to ask for it because being in the valley is no fun. Lord, put me back on the mountaintop with you. Too many times we have not because we ask not. When we ask, we don't ask the right way. What do we do? We just say, well, generic, real vague. David knew better than that. I mean, in all honesty, if you had, you know, we, we all use our phones today for communication. If you had the Jehovah app on your phone, and you could just text with God at any moment, get an encouraging word, boop, boop, Lord, I need your help. <laughs> and he, like, answers back and tells you exactly, wow, man, that thing's awesome. He knew exactly, he's better than AI, right? He's the one true, and I mean, he's the only intelligent being, right? <laughs> Imagine if you had such a device or such an option with, with that kind of communication with God. Once you figured out that this thing was powerful, you would really start using it. Lord, I see that light, that, that green light. It looks like it's about to turn yellow, do I speed up or slow down? I mean, we would ask it for everything. In fact, we would probably get so superstitious, we would quit trusting our own instinct and just ask God directly, wouldn't we? Amen. Now, we have to have enough confidence in God that we're not afraid to, to cry out to God and ask for specific blessings. God 
help my flesh in this area, X, Y, and Z. God, uh, what was the man where he healed? And he said, do you believe? And he said, he said all things are possible if thou believest. So he said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. What a prayer. Well, I believe a little, but God, you've got to help me to believe the rest of the way. Are, are you afraid to ask God to help you believe the truth? Are you afraid to ask God for greater blessings or specific miracles in your life? Or here what David is doing is very detailed, specific direction. Look at verse 2. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. He says, you smite them and you save them. David uh, was an awesome opportunity here. Uh, he's a picture of Christ in certain ways. And he's a picture of a Savior here. He says, go and save that city on my behalf. Go and save their lives because I want them saved and you're the man I'm going to use to do it. David had that intuition to ask God for help. He prayed a very specific prayer. He had a detailed request, and you know what? God gave him an even more detailed answer, didn't he? He didn't just say, yes. He said, go and smite them and go and save Keilah. I mean, he said, kill the enemy and save the good guys. How interesting is that? And I just wonder, now think about it. Think about it, guys. Do vague prayers get answered as often as specific prayers? Do you say, Lord, bless our church? And God says, I have. How about this? Lord, thank you for my church. How about, Lord, thank you that we have a really good roof on this building? Thank you that you keep bringing visitors just about every single service? Lord, thank you for the new friends and thank you for the new opportunities to grow. I mean, I, we, should, we should thank the Lord specifically and we should ask of the Lord specifically as well. Well, David's doing that and I believe God answers more specific prayers. I believe that's his will is that we'd have big enough faith to ask for a big thing or a specific thing. Look at verse 3. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more when we come to Keilah against the armies of Philistines? He says, Right now we're over here. When we go, and David and Saul's after us, but you want us to go over here where the enemy is at and the enemy's attacking? Now think about it. It's in David's blood at this point to just go out and fight for good. That's what he was doing all the way. I mean, since Goliath and even before that, the Lord was training him by sending a lion that he could kill and sending a bear that he could kill. And David learned to have faith in God for that. So when it comes to this, he's like, I hear there's an army of Philistines over there. I've killed armies of Philistines before before because God was with me. So Lord, you want me to go over there? But now his men, if you remember, these were some of his family and some of the discouraged and discontented and debted, we learned last week. These were some of the outcasts, if you were. Uh, they may not have been the most prestigious warriors. They're just kind of a, a ragtag gang, if you will, of guys coming together. Maybe they never served side by side. And maybe they didn't know each other entirely. Maybe they didn't have that cadence that an army, a well-oiled machine had. But David was trying to teach them that it's faith in God that gives us the victory. So they're like, we're afraid over here. Are you sure we need to go over there. Now, David gently entreated them. He didn't rebuke them and yell at them and call them evil people or anything like that. But he taught them in his actions by going back to the Lord again. Hey, we can always go and ask a second time, ask for confirmation. He says in verse 4, and then David inquired of the Lord yet again. David here is teaching us, here's my third point, to have a patient heart. A patient heart, long suffering, desiring to help others. Unlike Saul, he's like, I want to show you that, that God can help us. Instead of rebuking him or answering quickly, David showed them and he went back to the Lord and inquired yet again. Verse 4, then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, arise. Now he's getting very specific. Go down to Keilah. For I will deliver the Philistines into thy hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. 
fulfilling what God had said. Hey, you're going, you're going to save them, and there it is, he did. Not only that, but he has, now he increased his supplies. They're out there in the wilderness trying to figure it all out. Now he's like, hey, I've got some more cattle for you. I've got some supplies. I've got some extra food for you. Go and get this victory that I'm going to put right in your hand, and then for obedience, I'm going to reward you for your work. Next, I want you to see that through this that David had a Savior's heart. I don't mean anything blasphemous by this. I hope you understand. I'm not the Savior. I can't forgive your sins. We go out and teach people that it's through Jesus, but He wants us to teach. David didn't save us from hell. But there's a picture here that now that we're saved and we understand God's goodness, we ought to have that same heart of standing in the gap and saving others, both spiritually and physically when the opportunity arrives. It shows itself, right? David was laying down his life for others. Look at verse 6. And it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. Now, if you remember, this was the son of the priest that was killed by Doeg the Edomite. If we go back several chapters, David showed up with it. He was, you know, I got a couple young men with me. I have no food. I have no weapons. He said, here, take the holy bread. They replaced it. He said, do you have any sword? And it actually said, well, there is the sword behind the ephod wrapped in a cloth. And David said, there is none like it. So he took that sword and he left. Let, later, Doeg the Edomite killed this man's father, and 85 other priests in the entire city. He was the only one that left, and now he came to David. He had an ephod with him. You say, what is an ephod? What is an ephod? You see him all throughout the Bible. Uh, ephod is a garment, to put it in the most simplest way. An ephod is a linen garment specifically tailored for sanctuary service. The word sanctuary means sanctified. It has that connection. We, I, although this is a meeting place, we call it a sanctuary when we're here as a congregation. When the Holy Spirit is inside of us and we're gathered together, it is sanctified. It is set apart. It's to be a holy place. This wood is not holy. The pews are not holy. However, we don't want to use it for worldly things. We don't want to use it for a rock and roll hall on Friday night. And we should be respectful for the blessings God had given us. Now, back then they had the tabernacle, which had the sanctuary. Inside of it, before they could go in, there was two different levels of an ephod. There was the white linen ephod, white representing righteousness. Just as when we're saved, we put on that garment of righteousness. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm filthy rags, but He has given me of His perfection and righteousness. And now it's like I'm wearing a perfectly unspotted robe. I have no sin. Why? Because Jesus died for all my sins. The average priest wore the white linen ephod. The high priest wore the blue linen ephod. It was completely blue. That garment would have probably came from the knee and it's described to the shoulder. We know that by the instruments and things that go along with it. There was a breastplate. There were stones that could go into the ephod and also into the breastplate. There was a curious girdle that went around. A girdle is like a big belt, if you will. It also had stones and different colors. Uh, as, you know, uh, there's leather girdles in the Bible. Uh, so it gives the description of this garment. So if you imagine, he's got a priestly garment with him. When he fled, he took the garment that Goliath's sword was behind as everyone else was being killed. These garments were not something that you would just go around your daily life with. Now, it's not the same today. Uh, I don't work and move and dig ditches or, you know, do anything dirty in a suit jacket. I mean, yesterday I was in a dress shirt moving dirty wood and my shirt got dirty. I don't typically do that. And I say this, look, I, I'm bringing my best to the house of the Lord. That's why I wear a suit and a tie. You don't have to wear a tie to be holy, okay, or to be right with God. Let's just get that out of the way. However, when I come to church, I do try to dress up and I bring my best to the Lord. Uh, you know, Sunday's best, if you will. I mean, uh, this is how I dressed on the last job I had to interview for. I put on a suit and a tie and I got the job. Uh, now, if I would do that for a secular reason, there's no reason that I wouldn't do it for the Lord. Okay, I take it very professionally. That's why I wear a suit and a tie. You don't have to wear a suit and a tie to be right. A lot of the men that serve in the church, they take it seriously, right? Now, would I go, you know, dig a ditch in this outfit? No. That'd be foolish. Well, back then, it was prohibited. The linen ephod 
was made specifically, used specifically. It was for the sanctuary which was set apart, and it was only used for that. You had to cleanse yourself physically and a few other ways, spiritually. You had to separate from women for a few days before those men put that on and did the service to the Lord. Now, once you're saved, God wants you to be clean. There's some pictures there. It was all illustrations of what Christ would do. Christ is the one in the all blue ephod, if you will. That ephod was a linen garment worn for sanctuary service, and it represents the blue, if you know in the Bible, it represents royalty and righteousness. That white is holiness or cleanliness, so we have those pictures in the Bible. Why? Why is he about to use the ephod? Because that's what God said to do. Plain and simple. Now, if God said you have to wear a suit and a tie and shiny black shoes on a Sunday morning, then that's what I would do because I'm afraid of the Lord and I love Him and I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve Him. Amen. Right? If God said that you're, you know, uh, well, let's pick on hair for a minute, that women shouldn't have short hair that looks like a man's haircut and that men shouldn't have long hair that goes all the way down to their legs and looks like a woman's haircut. Okay, the Bible says that. So I do that. That's why I don't have long hair that goes down to my knee. Oh, come on, brother, we're in the New Testament. I know, but you know, God tells us even in the New Testament that a man shouldn't look like a woman and that a woman shouldn't dress like a man. I mean, we have these concepts in the Bible. So why did David get the ephod, what he's about to do? He's going to inquire the Lord again because his heart is to be an obedient heart to do it God's way, to do it the right way, to do it all the way. We live in a lazy society. They want to dumb it down. They want to water down the truth. They want to hide to you the reason. You know, and here's what's funny. Uh, there are certain ways that lawyers that are a bunch of snakes, they do things a certain way, and then they don't tell us what they're doing, but they're going to the full tilt of the law because they're using it with power. And that's a worldly, secular example. Now, we as Christians, if we understood the power in keeping God's law... Now that you're saved by faith, you say, God, I want your blessing on my life. And he says, okay, just do what I said. Read the Bible every day. You ought to open your mouth and preach the gospel to the lost because when you don't go out and talk to people, there's somebody you are supposed to meet that day and you can't wait on the other person and just say, well, God will take care of it one way or another. No. If you really believe that the Lord is all-powerful and that He rewards you for your work, we should do it to the best of our ability. This is why David goes and searches through the ephod. If you will, look at verse 7. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. So Saul says, aha, I got him now. Verse 8, and Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wasn't it just a couple verses ago that Keilah was besieged by the Philistines and Saul didn't care. He didn't come. But now that David's there after saving their lives and getting a great victory through the Lord, now Saul's like, I'm going to war. Let's go down there. Bring everybody. We're going to get them good. It's like, wait a minute. You see how Saul is so fickle? I'll kill David, but not the Philistines. He was probably afraid to go down and fight the Philistines. But he's so angry and just seeing red. He's not thinking it through. I'm going to go kill David, whatever it costs me or costs my army. He doesn't care about the lives. He wouldn't save Keilah from the Philistines. Look at verse 9. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. And he said to Ab Abiathar, the priest, bring hither the ephod. So he was conspiring against him, and he's using rebellious witchcraft methods. Gossiping and conspiring. A conspiracy. There are conspiracies in the Bible. A conspiracy is when two or more people get together and plot harm against somebody else. That's the simple definition of a conspiracy. That's what Saul did. Hey, so-and-so, come here. If you see David, here's how we're going to kill him. And so he had all these feelers out there and people out there, outliers, trying to catch him. Uh, but notice he, he ends that in verse 9. He says, bring hither the ephod. Here's my next point. David had 
an obedient heart. And he was blessed because of it. David had an obedient heart. He wanted to do it God's way. He wanted to bring his best, not his last. And that, you know, sometimes we bring our lame or we bring our last. David tried to obey every single law that he could, and he was blessed because of it. Verse 10, Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Again, David asking specific questions questions to God, expecting an answer, and he got it. Verse 12, Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me up and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. It's interesting here. He sought the ephod. The ephod was a picture of the breastplate of righteousness. You know, it's a kind of a pair. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. David wanted to do it God's way. He asked very specific prayers. He was not afraid to search of the Lord, inquire of Him to the fullest extent. I really believe that it's every Christian's duty to find time in your life, in your week, to get completely alone and to get on your face and to pour out your heart to God to cry out to God about everything going on. He knows it all. But when you cry out to the Lord, when you give it all to Him, and you just talk to the Lord, and you tell Him everything that He already knows, and He sees that you're dependent upon Him, and you believe you can talk to Him, and you have great confidence that He'll answer you, I believe the Lord answers those kind of prayers. Amen. A broken and a contrite spirit. Verse 13, Then David and his men which were about 600. So if you remember, he had 400 last chapter. He's added 200 now, just in one chapter. People are continuing to come to him. Uh, God is sending people to help build a new kingdom. And he's doing it with these first comers, these first men that broke free and said, I'm in debt, I'm discontented, I'm disheartened, and I need help, and I'm discouraged. And David is lifting them up and pointing them toward God and showing them a pattern of a man that leads not by pride, but by humility and love and compassion and serving others and praying to God. He's demonstrating this in his walk. These men are learning this of him and learning to have greater confidence in God. So he says in verse 13, Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could. That's kind of interesting. We're getting out of here wherever we can go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah and he forbore to go forth. So Saul said, Ah, he's left that city. I, we don't know where he's at. I won't go. Verse 14, and David abode in the wilderness in strongholds. So he's making little forts and encampments where he goes, where he can defend. And remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day. But God delivered him not into his hand. I underline things in my Bible. This is underlined. This is highlighted. This is a big deal. How was it Saul wasn't able to get him? Well, because God. He says, Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. I just want you to know that God protects those that rely on him. There are things in your life that are uncertain right now, and with everybody, it's something different. If you're older, perhaps it's like, well, I have enough resources to make it to the end. And, oh, Lord, keep me from great pain. I just want to go and see you in due season. If you're young, perhaps it's like, will I ever find the, the right man or the right woman to be married and start my life? If you're in the middle, it's like, God, I need help just day by day, keeping my family together and serving you. Saul sought him every day. Doesn't the devil come after us every day? Some way or another. And it says in verse 14, but God delivered him not into his hand. You know, he says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou art with me. That's the good news. God is with you. And if you're talking to him in the morning, when the devil comes in the afternoon, you're a little more confident and sure of the Lord's deliverance, and you're not afraid. Verse 15, and David saw 
that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the wood and strengthened his hand in God. This is another instance of Jonathan. One of the young men told me after we talked about Jonathan a couple chapters ago, he says, man, that's one of my heroes now. He's a good guy. I mean, he's got his stuff together. He's serving the Lord and helping people. Now, uh, who does Jonathan remind you of in the New Testament? Any thoughts? Any takers? Hard question. John the Baptist? Well, that's an interesting one. John the Beloved? What if, it, what if he doesn't have the name John? I think that's throwing you all off. <laughs> John, John, and John. All right. There's three good Johns in the Bible. What about Barnabas? Isn't Jonathan a lot like Barnabas? You think about Barnabas in the New Testament. He was generous. He was compassionate. He was supportive. He was always loyal. He was very loving and kind. Bold when he had to be to stand up. He was a good friend. Jonathan were, was all of those things to David, strengthening him everywhere he could. He says, Jonathan strengthened David in the Lord. He didn't do it in his pride. He didn't do it in self. He did it in the Lord. He didn't come and secretly say, make me your second best and I'll help you. No, no. He just came and said, hey, I, God is with you and God will protect you and God is guiding you. Have no fear. That's the kind of friends we need. I mean, isn't it? I would rather have a friend like that than a billionaire. I'd rather have a friend that would give me that spiritual strength when I need it the most. That's the kind of friends God wants us to have. And listen, if your best friends, if the people that you spend the most time with, if they're not like a Barnabas or a Jonathan, I might recommend to you, you find a different friend. You get a, away from that negative Nelly or whatever. You know? you know, I mean, seriously, we don't need to be around people that aren't living for God, that have a false gospel, that aren't saved. We need to be around people that want to live for God and want to encourage people and motivate them in the Lord. That's exactly what he did. It says, and strengthened his hand in God. He made David stronger in God. And that's exactly what he needs as he's going to become a king. Look at verse 17. And he said unto him, Fear not. Doesn't the Bible say that we should dissolve doubts of others? Dissolve their doubts. Yeah, but what if? And I'm not sure. And it's like, let me just dissolve that with the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, fear not. For the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find thee. He's eliminating his fears. You're not going to get found. And thou shalt be king. You know what he's doing there? He's confirming the prophecies. God said you're going to be king you're going to be king. Don't doubt it. Have no fear. No one can stop it. Not even the existing king. He says, Thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee. He's saying, I'll serve you. I'll be your right hand man. I'll serve you the best I can. I shall be next unto thee, and that also my father knoweth. He says, My father knows that these prophecy promises are true, and so do I, and you need to not forget it. You get strong in the Lord. Don't be afraid of my dad. Don't be afraid of anybody. You keep moving forward for the Lord. Jonathan was an awesome guy. Verse 18, he says, And they too made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. Notice he didn't go meet his dad. He wasn't uh, following his family to do wickedness. He understood separation from family that's walking in the wrong direction. He said, I'm going to my house. Dad, you can do whatever you want. If you're going to attack God's people, I'm not interested. You can kill me if you want. You can throw another spear at me. I'm going to my house. I'm not going along with you. Verse 19, Then came up the Ziphites to Saul. Now the Ziphites here, they're going to make an alliance with Saul. We'll see them again in three chapters. This is where we see them first. Then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood in the hill of Hakaliah, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desires of thy soul to come down. And our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. They're making a deal, if you will, with the devil. Hey, whatever you desire to do, come and do it in our land. It's, it's, you know, you, you're the king. You come to it. Verse 21, And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye have compassion on me. Isn't it interesting that some people will 
use God's name in vain when it suits their flesh? Oh, what a blessing you are. You're giving me exactly what I wanted. That's what Saul's doing. He's prophesying falsely. Verse 22, Go, I pray you, prepare yet, and know and see his place where his haunt is, and who hath seen him there, for it is told me that he dealeth very subtly. See therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself. And come ye again to me with the certainty, and I will go out with you, and it, shall come, and it shall come to pass, if he be in the land, that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. Saul also and his men went to seek him, and they told David. Wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. When Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Now, this is kind of the, he's over there, I'm going over there, he's over there, he's going over there. And we're going to see that in this next chapter or two, this, this run around where he's chasing him here, and he's chasing him there, and he's chasing him here. And God continues to deliver David because God had a plan, and he needed David to gather men, get victories, learn lessons. He says in verse 26, and Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul, for Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. It just makes me think of, can you imagine the cat chasing the mouse around the mountain? And the, you know, There's only two or three steps ahead, and it's like he just can't quite get there. Why? Because God's not blessing him. He's expending all of his resources to do something that God doesn't want him to do, and it's costing him. Look at this, verse 27. But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee, that means hurry up, haste thee, and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. <laughs> you know what happened? Hey, we need a king, we're under attack. Where are you at? You're not doing the duty of a king, and now we're under attack by the enemy. Where are you at? Hurry, we need some help. People are dying. Wherefore, Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines, Therefore they called that place Selah, Hema, Lekalp. And David went up from thence and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. So we see in this chapter that David trusted in the Lord to answer his prayers. He was very specific in what he said, what he asked for, the information that he needed. David was faithful to continue asking. He was compassionate to the people that were around him. He believed all, all the while that God was going to just take care of business. It's interesting here at the end, though, that God allows disaster to strike Saul's kingdom to prepare the way for David's kingdom. If you would go with me to Psalm 23 real quick, and we'll finish there. Sometimes God moves us around to prepare us for a bigger ministry. I think David, here's, here's a worldly phrase, David is going through the school of hard knocks. Is that what they call it? You get up and you get knocked down, and boy, that one hurt and that one cost me, and you get up and you get knocked down again. You say, well, I won't let that one happen to me again. I learned my lesson there, right? If you've ever been in a situation, whatever it may be, you know, I mean, there's been computer issues I've learned the hard way. I remember years ago, I, man, I mean, years and years ago, back when computers looked like TVs. Remember, do you guys ever remember that old, there was a Macintosh, an iMac that looked just like a TV, like a big bubble TV, and it was a bright yellow or green, or, and I was working on one, and I'm trying to get my screwdriver to the right spot, trying to get the hard drive out, and I hit a capacitor. I hit the tube connected to the capacitor. You know, now, you know, on those old TVs, it held a very strong electrical charge. And so I'm working, and it like, whoa, whoa. Whoa, like, man, I can, I'm tingling. Wow, that was crazy. My hand's still, I'm like, I don't want to do that again. I think I've learned my lesson. I, I better be careful. I got to ground it out. I got to do something different. I got to, whatever I got to do, I don't want that to happen to me again, right? In life, God lets us get hurt or ran around or ran over so that we can learn good lessons for ministry in the future. It's all for ministry. But sometimes we get so selfish, we think it's just so that we look better. Well, I made it through that. I'm the victor. No, God gave you that victory because He wants you to minister to others. It's, it's for ministry continuously. Look at Psalm 23, 
Short and sweet. We'll finish here. Look at that. Verse number one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. What? Now, Jesus is the shepherd and the bishop of our souls. And when he says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, he's saying, he's not saying, uh, it, what, the way the word want is properly used is I'm not going to need anything. I don't go to the cupboard and it's empty because God's providing. Our wants usually are like, I need a bigger house, a bigger car, a bigger bank account. That's not what it means. It's talking about your needs. God's going to provide for your needs. He says in verse 2, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. It's interesting, the illustration here is that I'm a lamb. And God is the shepherd. And He brings me to a peaceful place. And He lets me get some rest. If you've ever been down and discontented and discouraged, sometimes just getting a few minutes of peaceful rest is a big deal. Now, now if you're, you know, if, you live, if, if you're a spoiled teenager and mom does all the work for you and you just lay around all day, that's different. You, know, you, you probably can't sleep well anyway because you're too distracted with the cares of the world, right? Don't stare at your phone until 11 o'clock at night. You won't sleep well, right? Uh, but God wants to give us that rest and the peace. He wants to give us the restorative rest. He says in verse 3, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Notice all of that is to build us up and point us in the right way. Righteousness in what's right with God. And he does it for his name's sake, for his glory. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You can walk through a dark, dark hallway or a dark alley at night and not have to be afraid. Young ladies, you can walk in the grass and not have to worry about snakes when God is with you. And it says, His rod and His staff. You know, one is for correction. That's the rod. And the staff is used to reach out and get a hook around you and pull you out of where you don't belong. That's what the shepherd used those items for. So he'll correct you when you're going the wrong way. And he'll pull you out and, and save you when you're off the path. Verse 5, Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. You think, I want you to just meditate on verse 5 for a second. David is surrounded by cities that are quick to turn him into Saul. Saul was secretly working and getting a bunch of people to try to find him. Saul himself was sending thousands and thousands of men after him. And every night, David sat down at a table had a peaceful dinner with his family. He said, you've prepared a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I'm surrounded by enemies, and yet I can come together and have dinner with the family. He says, my cup runneth over. When you run out of something to drink, your cup is dry. When you've got more than you can consume in one night, your cup is running over. Who has extra supplies for tomorrow? Who's going to have breakfast tomorrow because you've got your cup runs over? And the next day, and the next day. Isn't God good to us? Amen. Think about what he's saying. I'm on the run. My enemies are after me, and yet I have more than I can eat. I've got more than I need. I'm blessed. I'm content. I get rest. I get a good night's sleep. Saul couldn't get a good night's sleep for anything in the world. Look at verse 6. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David made this point. He says, uh, uh, rather than kingdoms and followers and riches, what I want is goodness and mercy. I want God to be merciful to me and cut me some slack. And I want God to be good to me and really bless me and just fill me with His Holy Spirit. He says, it'll follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David, while he's on the run, he had a priest that did things the right way. He had the ephod. They had the Word of God. David had a harp. They worshiped God. And you know what they did in the camp when they were surrounded by the enemy? They had church. And he says, here we are out in the wilderness all by ourselves. And we're not in the temple or the tabernacle. We're not with the, the great. We're just the few out here alone. And we're still going to worship the Lord. We're going to sing unto Him. And all the days... Notice what he says. I will dwell in the house of the Lord even beyond this life. When you die, you're going to the house of the Lord in the sky, if you're saved, 
And he says, I'm doing it now, and I'll do it then. I've got great peace now. It'll get better then. And until then, I'm just going to trust the Lord. Man, God is so good. I just want to encourage you in that. Listen, David started out that chapter by helping somebody else that couldn't protect themselves. And God finished it off by letting the enemy attack Saul because he thought he could get David. God protected David because David protected others. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much. Uh, you've really blessed us. And Lord, I love these stories out of 1 Samuel. And I pray that You would help us to continue to learn great principles so that we can honor You with all of our life. Lord, You heard our prayer requests earlier, and there are some that are very specific this week. I ask that You would help us strengthen the ladies that aren't with us, the moms that aren't with us tonight. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.